question about Dr. Mangal Pariyar. Uh, he's been an all-round personality in orthopedics, as I see from his CV. He's done the Ranawat Fellowship in Joint Replacement after his uh, passing out from uh, KEM. He's also worked for a long time with Dror Pele at uh, uh, Baltimore regarding uh, he's a major figure in the reconstruction field in orthopedics today and he's working at various institutes in Mumbai. Uh, recently, we have heard a very brilliant uh, blog from him regarding his experiences about the recent uh, Mumbai blast when he was involved in the treatment of many of these injuries at the uh, HN hospital. Uh, we'll divide this session into two talks as he has told me. First will be the biology and the biomechanics of this fixator. That is the uniaxial dynamic uh, fixator. And the uh, second talk will be about the technique. Uh, the video presentation, uh, what I've been told is that it's available freely on YouTube. So those of you who are desirous of viewing the videos can do so on the YouTube. Uh, I invite uh, Mangal to start the proceedings. And just a modified thing, I'll also like to see the slides from front. So I'll sit over there if you don't mind. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> what we are talking on in the um, rail fixator also is basically using a unilateral um, fixator to apply the principles of Elizarov. So none of this is going to work without knowing the principles of distraction um, histogenesis, right? So we are going to talk about that. I am also going to talk about um, some issues of biomechanics and then hopefully we can have some uh, question answers that are that come up from this. So, what Elizarov described about distraction histogenesis was that controlled distraction in a stable environment leads to neohistogenesis. So, you need the uh, biology and you need the biomechanics over there. So when you are doing a distraction histogenesis, what is actually happening? You know that we do the osteotomy, we allow it to rest for 7 to 10 days and then start a gradual distraction. So when you start distraction after the first um, 7 days or so, what you are getting is um, the fibers which are oriented oriented in a uh, parallel sort of uh, fashion. <coughs> no, that's fine. I, I can show it from here. Uh, fibers which are oriented in a parallel um, fashion, all the cells which are there, which are mesenchymal cells, fibroblasts, they also start getting oriented in a uh, longitudinal direction. All of the vasculature that is there at this time is intramedullary. So this zone which you see as the striated area, that is all um, avascular, right? <clears throat> By week two, this vascularity has started now entering into that fibrous zone from uh, each side. So the edges um, of the host bone and the fibrous interzone is invaded by the vascularity and the mesenchymal cells have been turned, are turning into osteoblasts in that region because of the invasion of the uh, vascularity. And these osteoblasts now start laying down conical micro columns of bone over there. As distraction proceeds, um, the length of these micro columns increases the fibrous interzone, that is the central most portion of this, continues to remain avascular till the time that distraction is uh, going on. So this effectively becomes like the equivalent of an epiphyseal uh, plate. And that's where the real sort of um, growth is occurring from, or that's where the real lengthening is occurring from. And this area where you have the micro columns which are formed is known as the primary mineralization front. So in the earlier sort of slides, you saw that the vasculature, which is a sort of micro vasculature, has come up to the mineralization front. 
Now you start having vascular sinuses also at the PMF, which is just a function of the further maturation of the vascularity at that region. Now, so this process continues as long as you continue uh, distraction. And normally we say that the fibrous interzone in this uh, region uh, should not exceed more than about one third or half of the distraction gap. If you see that the fibrous interzone is, is more than one third or half of that, it probably is a good idea to slow down the um, distraction. So you are not left with a situation where suddenly you have four and five centimeters of a gap and no bone in between and then you have to go around asking people, you know, what now what should I do because you've got a non-union down and a non-union um, on top. Once the distraction is stopped, your micro columns from each side, uh, they sort of come and meet each other and you now have a complete consolidated area of bone. This is not your normal lamellar bone, this is a uh, endochondral ossification kind of bone. So this is just one big sheet of um, bone. This is bridged and the vascular columns also are um, bridging across, uh, sorry, the, the vascular channels also now go from one side to the other. Over a period of almost a year to two years, this then remodels to what we call as normal bone, where the bone is now in a haversian system you have uh, the normal contents of the medullary canal in the center and you have a medullary canal that is formed. So how <clears throat> does this uh, tie in with, how does this biology tie in with the biomechanics? Some of this stuff is, is related to the Elizara, but it equally holds true. What I'm trying to point out to you is the importance of stability. <laughs> <clears throat> so, Elizarov did all of these experiments sometime in the 1960s, late 1960s. But because all of this was in the um, Russian literature and the West was at that time sort of suspicious of the Russian literature, this was all redone. Exactly the same experiments were done by Jim Aronson in Arkansas. So, one of the basic things of the um, Elizarov method is that the rate as well as the rhythm is important. Now, rate is how much do you distract per day, which we normally say is one millimeter per day. And rhythm is in what breakup you distract it per day, which is normally we say, you know, four times a day, that is 0.25 millimeters, uh, four times a day is, is what we say. <clears throat> So to test this hypothesis, what they did was they had sort of three groups of um, animals. One was the null hypothesis that rate and rhythm is not important. So to test the null hypothesis, they created the entire gap at one time. And they found that all of the animals had a non-union at the distraction gap. That is, you want to have a two centimeter lengthening, you distract it two centimeters and at the end of you know, uh, three weeks, four weeks, you check what is the situation. And all of them had a non-union. In one group, they did a sporadic daily distraction. That is, the whole uh, distraction was done at one time, one to one and a half uh, millimeters of distraction. And this was what was earlier practiced before the advent of Elizarov. Uh, lengthening was performed by the use of the Wagner method where one sort of turn every the, the entire distraction was uh, done and that was in, in uh, one and a half to two millimeters also. Now the one of the issues with the Wagner always was uh, that the Wagner, we used to take off the Wagner and then put a plate in and a lot of bone grafting and the same situation was seen over here also. In the experimental animals, all of them had a non-union. In another group, they did 0.25 millimeters daily. That is a rate of 0.5 millimeters and a rhythm of twice in a day, where they found premature consolidation in all of the animals. 
when they did the uh, the original sort of Elizarov uh, described method of 0.25, they found that all of the uh, osteotomies united and remodeled to normal. When they used an auto distractor, which actually provides, it's a mechanical thing which provides distraction uh, once every minute. So that is 1,440 steps to achieve one millimeter. They found that the fibrous interzone was barely seen. It was not even the one third which we described. It was very, very thin. And in some of them, they, they got a premature consolidation. So the rate of point, uh, sorry, the, the rate of one millimeter per day was good. The rhythm of 0.25 millimeters four, time, uh, four times daily was good. So is the rhythm more important or is the rate more important? To look at that, they did 0.5 millimeters six hourly, which is a rate of four times a day, uh, sorry, a rhythm of four times a day, but a rate of two millimeters. Again, they found less osteoid and less mineralization. That means not as good bone formation as one millimeter per day. So what is the importance of all of this? <laughs> the importance of all of this is uh, that you have to follow this basic principle. You cannot sort of change this principle. One of the problems with uh, all orthopedic surgeons, you know, uh, is the, uh, what do you call it? Not, it's not the beauty, but it's, it's the facility or they, they, are, they are big innovators. Orthopedic surgeons are big innovators. The problem is you start innovating even when you are doing your first case. Innovation is something when you learn the technique first, you know the original technique well and then you innovate to your local circumstances. How we innovate? Are is ye to bola tha ki 0.25 millimeters six hourly. But I now if you are a resident, then uh, I have to go to the OT now and then I have to do dressing, then I have to meet my girlfriend in the evening. And in the night, there's a party where we are boozing. So let's do the one millimeter now only and finish it off. Okay. So that kind of situation then leads you into um, trouble. It's much easier for us to teach the patient how to do this so that you can do the 0.25 millimeters six hourly. As of even today, I mean, this is, we've started, I've been doing it now for since 92. And we still follow this principle uh, without any sort of trouble. <clears throat> then the importance of stability. To look at the issues of stability and that of the, um, the way that the osteotomy is done. Uh, there's a lot of talk about how the osteotomy should be done and most of you all who, who are not very conversant with the Elizarov, I'm sure have the idea that the Elizarov is um, only cutting the cortex. Technically, that is not possible. I cannot do that. And I think this misinformation comes about from one of those famous pictures in Elizarov's textbook, where there is a picture of a you know, corticotomy, or the, the cortex has been cut, and they've done a dye injection where you can see the uh, where you can see the uh, vessel still intact. And that is what everybody is supposed to do. But it, it doesn't happen like that. Because the, normally the place where we do the osteotomy is in the metaphysis. When you do the metaphysis, there is no artery over there. It has already sort of broken up into multiple small uh, branches. But the idea of what Elizarov said in terms of corticotomy is a low energy osteotomy, so that you, dis you damage the soft tissues or the um, vascular potential of that area to the minimum. So how they studied this was they used a standard four ring construct which was stable and did three kinds of osteotomies. One was an open osteotomy, which is what the uh, Italian group does, Di Bastiani and all that's what they describe, where they do a large um, incision about uh, inch, inch and a half expose the periosteum, retract the periosteum, make multiple drill holes in the bone, cut the bone through and through, and then uh, do the distraction after seven to 10 days. 
Second is the two-third osteotomy, which is what was described by uh, Elizarov. That is only a small 10 millimeter incision on the front. Cut the medial cortex, cut the lateral cortex, and the posterior cortex is broken by rotational osteoclasis. And the third group was the closed osteoclasis, where what they do is uh, like you would break a bamboo or a piece of stick, where you know you have one point against which you bend it. So what they did to focus the force was pass a wire very close to the bone without cutting the bone, and then just bend the bone against that wire. So that led to a closed osteoclasis at that point. <laughs> now what they found in all the three groups was that the entire gap was filled by osseous tissue. The only difference was with a two-third osteotomy, what they found at day 7 was found at day 14 with an open osteotomy, which basically says that when you have created more sort of iatrogenic damage, it takes a little more time for the body to heal. So normally if the, even the Italian group would say that 10 to 12 days after the osteotomy, they would start uh, distraction. So that's a function of how much so injury has been caused. So either with complete or partial marrow transection, complete marrow, uh, marrow transaction in the open osteotomy and partial marrow, marrow transaction in the two-third osteotomy, they found exactly the same histologic changes. Only difference was temporally it was different. What they found in, on day 77 with the uh, you know, partial, they found on day 109 of the complete transaction. So what, what this says is when you do an osteotomy, you have to be as low energy as possible. You have to try and spare the tissues as far as is possible. If you have imparted more energy than you would like, then you wait for a little longer before you start distraction. <laughs> when they looked at stability, how they looked at stability was they used one, wire, uh, one ring in the proximal, one ring in the distal segment with wires which were not tensioned, that is minimal stability. Then they used one ring in each segment with wires that were tensioned, that is a better stability. And then they used four, rather two rings in each segment with properly tensioned wires and that was the best stability. So with the maximum stability, what they found was the direct intramembranous class, uh, ossification. And with minimal stability, they found what, it, what they found was more of fibrous tissue and non-union. With intervening stability, they found a little bit of uh, cartilage and a sort of true synovial pseudarthrosis forming. So the lesson for us is that when you are trying to do a distraction osteogenesis, um, you cannot just slap on three rings, two rings, and two wires in each. No, you've got to have, you've got to know what is the stability. Um, you, whatever fixator you're using, even if you're using um, the rail fixator like what we are going to discuss, you got to look at the stability. There are inherent issue, uh, sort of factors which lead to stability in, in this fixator, but you have to know what those um, factors are. Now, in, in relation to um, the pathophysiology, that is how this relates to the um, biomechanics is that when you have instability, you have something which is more than micro motion, what we call macro motion, and that would lead to shear, and all those micro columns which I showed you in the first few, few slides, all that microvasculature which I showed you in the first few slides, that forms, and every time there is a shear motion that breaks away. So the body doesn't get a chance to build up onto what it has been um, doing. And the rate and rhythm is probably affected by the uh, cellular pathways that the amount of ATP that can be uh, created or the amount of uh, activity that the mitochondria will tolerate or will generate is only so much. So if you go beyond one millimeter per day, the at a micro 
level they just the, the cellular pathways just cannot keep up with the amount of stuff that is um, required so we say it very often that uh, sometimes if you find that you are marching in a you know a bunch of soldiers marching in a column and some of them get ahead then you have to wait till the rest of them catch up and that's what we frequently have to do when we are uh, monitoring so all your other surgeries you know uh, when you are doing an internal fixation when you are doing a knee replacement the whole sort of team is at maximum uh, level of attentiveness etc as soon as you enter into the ot the patient is induced you open everything you are working with your all concentration um, over there till closure and once you've closed it you sort of forget about that and that's what you call an operation the time when you know you are maximally giving attention to that the main or the important difference between the elizarov technique and other methods of treatment is the elizarov operation starts with the application of the fixator and ends with the removal of the fixator so your level of attention and the level of sort of monitoring has to be during this entire time not forget about the patient once he comes out of the ot so you have to keep monitoring the patient with x rays clinically etc um all the time now if you do a traumatic corticotomy <laughs> then you will create a disturbance in blood flow and therefore obviously you have to wait for a little while before you start the distraction um and if you do an early removal this is the other problem that a lot of people have i i keep telling um people that you know do fellowships with me and sometimes patients that if i have better results in terms of elizar of than the next guy it is probably number one reason is i am better able to resist patient pressure for early removal i see this too often that all right we finished the lengthening now we'll take off the fixator and put on a cast if a cast is more convenient than the fixator that you put on then you have not put the fixator on well because with with the fixator patient can bathe patient's joints are are moving so you know it you have to put on your fixator so well that after it's healed you take out the fixator and nothing else should be required that's when you take out the fixator so that's that's about the uh <clears throat> biology